Christ. That's who we are, church. We don't just come here like, like uh, kumbaya every week just to feel good and pat ourselves on the back, like, you know, being uh, just spiritually moral and feeling good about that. But we are here for a purpose. We are here for a mission. That's what Jesus says. This is not just some mantra as a pastor I'm making up to try to stir up faith. But it's, it's here written very clearly in the word of God that he calls us his body. He calls us his extension. That through his body we are able to demonstrate to be his hands and his feet and his mouthpiece. Declaring the goodness of God and showing the mercy of God through how we give, how we live, and how we treat people. And so in this broken world, more than ever, we need to rise up. And, um, you know, my good friend, and, and he's over at the main campus right now. He oversees our main campus, Pastor Billy Lyle. Um, he just got back from Japan uh, while all that was happening in Maui. Um, coincidentally, he was already in Japan for a ministry trip, ministering to the youth of Japan over there. And uh, so while he was in Japan, that's when everything went, uh, the fires happened uh, in our island, Big Island and Maui, and uh, they were encouraging him. Because in Japan in 2011, March 11, for those of us who remember, there was a, a massive 9.0 earthquake off the coast of Tohoku and Sendai, and that entire region was devastated. I just looked up the number of people that died. It was n over 19,700 people that perished, and there's thousands of people that still have not been um, uh, rescued or they, they can't find them. There's thousands of people still missing. And um, so what they said, the Jap Japan church, was they were encouraging Pastor Billy that even though this death, all the death that happened and all the great loss, it's so tragic. It's so painful to go through. But they knew that through it, God can do something. That's the beauty of God, is that God is not the author of, of death and destruction and what we just saw last week in Maui. Uh, neither is he the author of, of death and destruction, what happened in Japan uh, over a decade ago. But through it, because he is God, he can do something through it. And uh, so there's, um, in that region, Miyagi, um, one single individual, one pastor went out to plant churches. 75 churches have been planted since through this one individual and many other churches outside of him and his ministry. And so they were talking about, because of what happened, it was an opportunity for God's love, where there's great darkness, God's light shines even brighter. And I say that because that is a picture of what God can do right now in our state, what God can do right now on Maui, and what God can do through our lives. Through our lives, if we choose and willingly. Just like the, the pastor in Miyagi choosing to go out in, and I'm sure maybe he suffered some kind of loss or was directly affected by that. And it caused something to rise up in him, a resilient spirit, saying, I'm going to do something about it. And so today as we conclude our series, Resilient, we're going to talk about that, resilient to the end. And uh, we've been looking at the ministry of Elijah. Um, some, some say he's a foreshadowing of Jesus in his ministry. And it's really, he's, he's, uh, many will say he's the most powerful prophet that have ever walked the face of this earth. And so that's where we've been in, in 1 Kings. And we're going to revisit a passage real quick that I think Pastor Lexin preached on um, during his time on the pulpit here a few weeks ago. 1 Kings chapter 18 says this, Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. People said nothing. And so the, the first thing we, the reason why I'm recalling this passage that we went through is that we need to recognize and re remember that we live in a fallen world. So what we just experienced as a state and a nation um, with the devastation of Maui, what the people were going through at this time in 1 Kings, same thing. They were going through some hardships, but the hardships here, it's interesting to note, Elijah's try, trying to call the people back into worship and commitment, into following and trusting God. However, people were worshiping Baal, and Baal was not okay to worship 
And uh, this is a recap again. We, we went over some of the details, but in a nutshell, what Baal worship included, because he's the fertility god, known as the fertility god, is that people had to sacrifice their firstborn child so that they could get more children. Because in that time, children were highly prized and valued. That is their legacy. More important than people's 401ks and their house, it was really having a large family. That, that was the goal in life back then. That was one of the main things that drove people. And so they were willingly giving up, sacrificing their firstborn, killing their firstborn at the altar of Baal. But the other thing that was really atrocious is how we come here fully clothed, worshiping God in purity and righteousness. What Baal worship included, because he is the fertility God, was temple prostitution. So worship, I'm not going to go into details, but worship involved that. And so you can see how appalling, how disgusting that is. And so Elijah's ministry the whole time from uh, calling King Ahab to repent to calling the people to repent, but yet Ahab, um, Elijah here is giving people a choice. If God is God, worship him. If Baal is God, worship him. But instead of a response, people did nothing. Now let's re rewind hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, before that moment, into the Garden of Eden. Similarly, God was very clear that the reason you don't eat from this tree is because of our relationship, Adam and Eve. I want you to trust me. I want you to depend on me. Once you eat from this tree, the knowledge of good and evil, instead of de depending on me and God's word, what God says is good and evil, you're going to make a determination of what is good and evil, what is right and wrong, and that's going to lead to death, and God wasn't lying. Because what death in that portion of Scripture is referring to is not a bodily death, but a spiritual death. And since that time, because man chose to disobey God and trust in himself and what was pleasing to the eye rather than what God had already said and declared, the rights of earth have been handed over to death and destruction and sin. And so from the tragedy that we experience, the hurricane, the high winds, and the fires that have caused so much death, uh, the, over the course of the last few weeks in Maui to what we talked about in Sendai and Tohoku and then all the way back to Elijah's days. It's a pattern that has been repeating itself. And if we're seated here right now and we're like, that's not okay. I agree with you. That is not okay. It's a constant reminder that the world we live in is fallen. But the good news is from the very beginning, God had a plan. And that's why I love, I love, reading the Bible, period. But I love Genesis. Right off, in the, in, right off in Genesis, God had a plan. That from the very beginning in the garden, God said that through Adam and Eve's descendant, that there would be one that was coming and was going to crush the head of the serpent. And that happened 2,000 years ago for us, 2,000 years ago on the cross through Jesus. And the perfect life that Jesus lived. And... You know, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I get mad at Adam and Eve, right? Like, how could you? You, you know, and, and especially when tragedy, like what happened, happened uh, here in this state and on Maui, we get mad. Like, because you, because you did this, now we experience this. And it's not just natural disasters. We're talking about wars. We're talking about cancer. We're talking about all these things that happen that bring pain and destruction within our lives and our loved ones. But the last time I checked, I'm not perfect. The last time I checked, you're not perfect. And so if we were the ones, replace Adam and Eve, you put us in the garden, we would have done the exact same thing. But again, God had a plan. So let's go to... Romans chapter 5, verse 12 and 15. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, that's what we see today, and in this way, death came to all people, that includes us, because all sinned. Verse 15. When you, when you hear all that, that, that's just painful to read. This but is a very encouraging but but the and get your minds out of the gutter please <laughs> but the gift is not like the trespass 
For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Praise God. And so I remember when I first got saved at 15 years old, uh, I don't know what it, you know, I'm Chinese, so I was probably calculating things in my head. And I'm like, man, Jesus died for the sins of the world. That's a lot of sin. You know, that's a lot of people. It, it almost seems like God rigged the system and he's cheating. Like, how can one man's death provide coverage for everyone's sin? I mean, if his blood washes away our sin, like, you'd think by now, in this year, you know, 2023, the, the blood, would, there would not be enough droplets going by, cleansing each and new um, human being being born, receiving Jesus. Is there any left? You know, so what used to be maybe a cup of blood is now like, like getting more, more and more um, broken down into smaller droplets. And it didn't make sense to me at that time. I trusted in God. I was following God. I was growing with God until I finally got the revelation of what the scripture is saying. It's, I, I'm thinking about sin after, but what God is saying is the sin that happened before. And so this whole time, it's funny, I, it went both ways, right? When I thought, how can Jesus' blood cover the world's sins? I also was mad. I was like, how can Adam and Eve, it's all their fault and what they did and allowing sin to enter the world, and now we have to pay the consequence or live through the consequences of it. But Romans here is putting it upside down on our heads for us. Is that through one man... Because one man allowed sin to enter, how much more so through the perfect life of this man, fully God but fully man. His name is Jesus. Now don't, don't think too hard right now in this moment because you're going to lose the rest of the message. How can Jesus be fully God and fully man? There are wiser people than us um, that spend their whole life trying to, complicate, to compl com contemplate that and get stuck on that thought. In our finite minds, we will never truly be able to comprehend the personhood of Jesus on this earth. Fully man, fully God. Because he's fully man, he's fully God, he was able, able to live that perfect life. So you could have a loved one die on the cross for you because they love you and they don't want you to experience eternal death, but that loved one also is imperfect. That loved one also has sin. That loved one, that means also has a debt. So if, they, if you're in debt, you can't pay someone else's debt. Jesus is the only one. He is the only one that could do what he did and he did for us 2,000 years ago. But all of that that I just said gives us hope. Because also, because Jesus already has done it, we know that what he's going to do as well is true. And so for those of us who have read the entirety of the Bible, we, we, we're tracking right now with Genesis, we understand that. But also the last Bible, last Bible, last book of the Bible in Revelation talks about the second coming of Christ. And when Jesus comes back, it's going to be a party. Not just for us believers because we've been worshiping him faithfully here on this earth. But when Jesus comes back, it's going to be a party because he's going to make right all that is wrong. He's going to restore and redeem everything. And turn it back to how God originally created it to be. But until that time, we still live in a fallen world. And until that time, God continues to work. God is not off the clock and waiting for that moment for Jesus to come back. His hands are not tied, but he is still working his perfect plan. And so even in Maui, you heard from Pastor Jonathan on video, who's the senior pastor in charge of our Grace Bible Church in Maui. And uh, this past week, um, or sorry, two weeks ago when everything happened, his sister, Sharina, lives in Michigan. Again, she helps oversee um, ministries with our Grace Bible Maui Church. And so as soon as it happened, she's at the Michigan airport right away getting the first flight back to Maui to assist her brother and assist those in Maui. She's there, she's praying at the airport. God, show me who I need to talk to right now because she wanted to do something right now. All the way in Michigan. God shows her, go talk to this one man. She doesn't know him. She goes up to him, finds out his name is Craig. And uh, Craig is coincidentally from Mercy Ministries, also going to Maui because obviously they're at the, the same gates about to board the plane. 
He's with a ministry called Mercy, Mercy Chefs. Mercy Chefs. You can look them up. They have a website. But they're a Christian organization that goes to disaster sites to cook meals. Because, you know, when you're going through stuff, right, the food can be a way to the soul just to bring comfort. And so they bring clean water and, and just quality cooked food because Mercy Chefs are, are um, uh, professional chefs that go out to assist those in need. And so this is Craig. He's coming back from Ukraine. He was o- just over at Ukraine serving with Mercy Chefs on his way to Maui. And he's like, yeah, I'm on my way to Maui, and it's great meeting you, Sharina, and that's great you're with the church. How can I help? So Sharina calls her brother, and her brother, Pastor Jonathan, we saw in video, is like, I don't know what we're going to do right now. There's 150 Maui PD officers. Um, they're supposed to have lunch, but it, somehow it's not working out, and there's going to be no food for these officers. And keep in mind, these officers, they've been serving relentlessly for 16 hours at a time, 18 hours, getting very little rest, barely seeing their family. And so at the very least, we got to get them some food. So he's like, what are we going to do? Shunir is like, you'd not believe this. And so she talks to Greg, Craig. Craig jumps on the phone, calls up the, the Mercy Chef ministry being set up uh, over there in Maui. And instantly that day, police officers, 150, 150 were fed a four-course meal. Let's give God some praise for that. Now, let's, let's zoom out a little bit in case you, um, you know, maybe you didn't get your coffee yet. So <laughs> we missed the details here. Okay, so Maui is the middle Pacific. This gentleman named Craig is coming back from Ukraine, layover in Michigan. Michigan is really far from Maui. Sharina is on her way from Michigan to Maui. Yet somehow, through all this time and distance, God's hand was not too short to save, to serve, and to deliver. Amen? And that's what God does, praise God. But you notice it was through people. It was through Sharina praying. It was through this man's faithfulness, Craig, to fly all the way from Ukraine, all the way to Maui to serve, that the intersection of faith and miracles happened. And so for Elijah, miracles are not unfamiliar to him. That's what he did as a prophet. He performed numerous miracles. And we've been tracking throughout the last uh, month as we were in this resilience series. And so let's go back to Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. Sorry, we read that. 1 Kings chapter 19 now. And uh, I'm going to give us some context before I read this just so that we aren't lost as we listen to this. Just as Elijah was called to bring hope to eternal world, we too are called to bring hope to eternal world. But we don't, like Sharina was praying and asking God, Elijah hit this moment. And again, this is when Pastor Lexon was sharing this word about there's times where we are so depleted and so empty, we hit a wall. And that wall can lead to depression. Depression can be such a deep pit. It leads to despair and sometimes even suicide. And so for Elijah, he hit this moment. But yet God came through. He sought God. And God ministered to him. One of the ways God ministered to him was he told him, go and anoint the next prophet. And his name is Elisha. Okay, so when you hear me reading Elijah and Elisha, I'm not talking about the same guy. I know sometimes, like, you know, English was not my first language. So it's like, wait, is he being FOB on us and twisting what he's saying? (laughs) It's two different names, okay? So we're going to see it with our own eyes. Um, So Elijah, being obedient to God, is on his way to go ahead and call Elisha into ministry. Here we go, verse 19. Elijah went there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. We're going to pause a little bit just to break down what we just read. So here, what was Elisha doing? Elisha was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. So that means a a yoke, it it pairs up the oxen so they can plow the dirt, the ground together. It's it's what farmers did so that then they can plant their seeds for the crop and harvest. And so 12 yoke of oxen, that's 24 oxen. That's a lot. It's a lot of ox. 
And um, I was thinking about that, right? Like, for me, I have four kids, and for some of us, we were like, that's a lot of kids, yes. And, and some people, they don't want to have, like, multiple kids because it's very expensive, especially living in Hawaii. And I'll say, yes, it's very expensive. And then my daughter, she, like, wanted, they, they, they wanted puppies and dogs. They're showing me pictures. I was like, we can't do that. You know, dog food is expensive. They, they have, like, all natural dog food, too. Like, some dogs eat better than humans. It's amazing. But that's another time, like, discussion. We're not going to go into that. And I was just like, wow, no, we're not getting a dog because I can barely feed my four kids right now. No, it's not that bad. Um, and, and, so, and so finally, my, my daughter, um, on her birthday, she was like, I really want a bunny. I was like, okay, bunnies are a lot cheaper. They're quiet. Okay, yeah, you know, because the four kids are noisy. The bunny's quiet. We can do, we can do a bunny. We did something crazy. Uh, there's a member here in our church that uh, her bunny had bunnies. You know, they, they thought it was the same sex, the two bunnies. But a- after going away for a party, they come home and they realize there's more baby bunnies. And so she asked, she knew we already had a bunny. She's like, would you like another bunny? I'm like, well, it's free. You know, I can, and then my, my daughter's been asking for another bunny for a while because bunnies, they're, they're a communal animal. They, they want to be in community. They, they love being around other bunnies. Uh, we named our bunny Bao Bao because Chinese, it looks like a little cha siu bao, you know, <laughs> manapua for those of us who don't eat dim sum too often. So we named them Bao Bao. Oh, Bao Bao's so lonely. Bao Bao needs a friend. And uh, we're like, okay, maybe this is God, you know, this, this person in our church is giving away another bunny. So we got another bunny. We named them Boba because it's a dark bunny. So we got Bao Bao and Boba. And, you know, like, you got to take it to the vet, trim the teeth and do all this. I'm like, what am I doing? So, so all that to say, you know, when you have animals, it's a lot of money. And so Elisha here, actually, when you look at it, even though he's a farmer, and oftentimes we're like, ah, oh, farmers, they're, you know, they, they probably are like blue-collar people. They, they don't have a lot. They work hard. Um, yes, Elisha, no doubt, was working hard because he himself was plowing behind the 12 oxen pair, right? So he's working hard, but he was actually very wealthy, to have that much, and when you study history, to have that much ox, uh, oxen, that's, that's a lot. So he's wealthy. And yet here comes Elijah throwing the mantle over him. Mantle is like a cloak that was worn. And for Elisha, he's recognizing what, is this, what the meaning of this is. And so we're going to see it next. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. So the cloak comes up. Man, you talk about a mic drop moment. Instead of dropping his mic, Elijah, he drops his cloak. He doesn't even say anything. That's so gangster, right? He's just like, throw the cloak, walk away. (laughs) Elisha, cloak hits him as, you know, he's plowing the oxen. And he's like, oh my gosh. And he runs and he chases after Elijah. So he runs after Elijah And then he says this, let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. So he realized this cloak, it represented the prophetic authority that Elijah carried. And so when Elijah threw that cloak upon Elisha, Elisha at that time, even without being said a word, understood that he's being called into this prophetic ministry. And so he wants to go home and say his goodbyes to his loved ones. And then he said, then I'll come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? Verse 21 then says, so Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen, slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. This is really fascinating to me. Being Chinese, I was like, man, you slaughtered all that oxen. It's like, it's like God calls you into ministry, and then you own 12 cars or 24 cars. You know, maybe you're a car dealer, and you're like, all right, you know, I'm, I'm going to follow God now. I'm no longer going to run this car dealership, and then, and then you blow up all your cars. So, like, you would sell the cars, right? So for Elisha, why did he not sell it? Because if he sold it, the oxen, right, to make money, that money is still a fallback plan. So when Elisha burned up the oxen and he used this plow as kindling to burn this oxen, this is amazing. This is Elisha saying, I am, 
And we, we heard that word today in prayer this morning as uh, I was praying with our intercessors. That's our prayer team that prays for us. One of our members, May, said the word total surrender. Total surrender. That's the word today. And that's the word some of us need to be hearing right now. That in this time and the day and age we've been living in for far too long, we've been living like the Israelites during Elijah's time when, when the word of God has already been declared to you and it's been so clear. That if God is God, serve God. But if Bell is God, serve Bell. And it said immediately the people did nothing. So some of us, we come to church. And, and yes, that is something. But when we go out, the word of God then becomes nothing inside of us. We don't do anything with the word. We're not changed by the word. It's up to us to receive the word of God, to allow faith to transform us. And so for Elijah, Elisha, when the mantle came upon him, I love what it said. It didn't say he did nothing. It said he ran after Elijah. There is a pursuit. There is a running after the call of God over our lives. But the reason why some of us haven't ran after the call of God upon our lives is because we haven't burned up the things of the past. And I know right now when we think about fire, I understand it's, it's kind of too soon, right? Because it has such a negative connotation. We talk about burning things up. But actually, I want to emphasize that because it's a reminder that the things that we hold on to dear in our lives, there's so many things that's out of our control that we could instantly lose it in a moment. So it's a good reminder that the very thing that we've been trying to preserve and keep from, from pursuing completely, total surrender, following God. And we're like, if I follow God completely, that means I'm going to have to give this up. Thinking this is what we really need or this is what's going to provide security or comfort or pleasure. Not realizing that if we don't choose to burn it up, eventually it will be burnt up anyways. Because only God is eternal. Everything else in this life is temporary. And this man, Elisha, was doing what he was supposed to do in the field, faithful. And some of us, we've been faithful. We've been going through the motions, faithful and plowing and plowing and plowing, but yet we haven't pursued the next level, the call of God upon our lives. And, and you know, for my life, when I got saved, there were things, this is, I grew up in the 80s, and uh, I had paraphernalia that wasn't, honoring to God. And as soon as I got saved, the Holy Spirit hit me and I didn't, you know, I didn't want to start a fire in, at my house. So I didn't burn it up, but I threw it in the trash can. I threw it away because I knew God didn't have to tell me. No one else had to tell me. I just knew it was wrong. Just like Elijah didn't tell Elisha to burn it up, but he knew that was going to hold him back. I knew this was holding me back from pursuing God and allowing God to form me and transform me. And so I threw it away in the trash can. I remember my friend came over and he was like, hey, uh, you know that, that, I'll just tell you, the VHS tape that you have, can I, can, I, can I have it? I was like, no, I threw it away. Why'd you throw it away? Because I follow God now. He's like, when did you throw it away? And he went to my trash can trying to look for it, digging in the trash. But that is a good picture. That is a good picture of how the world lives and how we're called to live. So for Elisha, when he burned up his plow and oxen, he was declaring there is no plan B. It's only plan A. It's only me continuing to pursue God to the fullest. And for my life, you know, after that moment, 15 years old, get saved, uh, for a while I was wondering, okay, God, what are you calling me to, right? What am I supposed to do with my life? Am I supposed to serve the church full-time as a pastor, a minister? Am I supposed to be out in the marketplace? Uh, I went to Cal State Northridge, was a business major, and even in, during that time, I, I was like, God, I'm going to give you one year. Like, I was dictating. God, I'm going to give you one year after, you know, like the Mormons, they give like one to two years after to serve in missions. I'm going to give you one to two years and serve on the campus as a missionary, and then I'll go into the marketplace. And then the whole time, I knew God was like, nope, it's not going to just be that time. You're going to serve me in my house longer than that. And I remember there had to be a crossroads where I completely just burned that up. I'm like, okay, hey, God, I'm going to serve you as long as you want me to serve you in your house. Now, what does that mean for the rest of us? Because not everyone's called to full-time ministry within the church. 
It doesn't mean you go quit your job and you, like myself or Elisha, jo join staff with some local church or our church here. That's not what we are saying here, and, and that's not the word saying. The word is saying is that God wants you to live at a new level. Everyone say new level. And to, the very starting point of living at a new level is not being held back by the things that are holding you back from that. And the reason why I'm being very vague is because in a room this size, it represents so many different things. I can't even go through an exhaustive list for the sake of time of what that may be. So for some of us, it's an actual material item, a pursuit that's causing us to compromise. Um, you know, we've been, we've been trying to save up for something. And because of that, we haven't been doing what God's been calling us to do or we've been... Um, doing things that have, are, are shady or we're, we're, you know, fudging the numbers on certain things. For certain things, it might be a sinful pattern. It might even be some kind of alcohol or substance abuse that we've been holding on to. For some of us, it's, it's bitterness. It's a wrong attitude. It's sin in our heart that we think no one else sees but God sees, and we haven't put it at the altar to burn it up for God. And, and here's the amazing thing. When Elisha burned up and slaughtered his oxen. It says that then he cooked the meat and gave it to the people. So I don't know how many of you like oxtail soup. You know, my household, we like oxtail soup. Some of you may like oxtail stew. I, he made oxtail barbecue stew, I think. You know, something like that, of that nature. Some oregano and China. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what he had. But, but Elisha here... It wasn't wasted because he used it to serve the people. But what I loved is when he gave it to the people, it was a declaration. That he was showing the people that I'm no longer the old Elisha, the farmer. I am now a man of God pursuing the prophetic call on my life, the call to ministry. And so he used it to bless the people. And, and that's what we're called to do. We're called to be a blessing to the people around us. It's not that now that we are walking with Christ and pastor, whoa, I'm good. Pastor said, pastor said to, see, I'm so excited about moving forward and going to the next level. I almost stepped off of this level. <laughs> Thank you. I know he was ready. That's why he's been lifting weights. <laughs> so for Elisha, as he's pursuing this new level here, he wanted people to know that, that just because I'm living a new life doesn't mean I'm going to shun all of you. I'm still called to love you. And so similarly to us, it's not that this total commitment and surrender to Christ means we cut off our old relationships. For a time being, for some of us, that may be necessary. If it's a toxic relationship, if it's a relationship causing us to compromise our faith, yes, that may have to happen. That's between you and God. But for most of us, it's, it's the people around us. It's not, okay, they're not in church. I'm in church. So I burned them up in this relationship, and I don't talk to them anymore. No, Elisha served the people, but look at this, right? What immediately after he follows Elijah happens here? It says, then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. The reason why so many of us are not living that resilient life is because we lose track of the purpose and why we are at where we're at. So even if we follow God, it's not following God so that we can be served. Like, God, serve me. I'm following you. Bless me. God, I'm following you, so serve me and give me my promotion. God, I'm following you, so give me my spouse I've been praying for. I'm still single some of us, we, we, we want to treat God like that, that, okay, I scratch your back, now you scratch mine, right? I did this for you, God, what will you do for me? But it says here that as Elisha burned up everything, and he's making this huge commitment to pursue God, he pursues God by being Elijah's servant. In the world's eyes, this is a demotion. In the world's eyes, this is a curse, not a blessing. So for, what does that mean for us? Right? So it's not that we go and it's like, okay, I heard the message. You go to your spouse. I'm going to burn up our marriage certificate. We're, marriage is over. God, God said, leave the past behind. So I'm leaving my marriage. Uh, I'm going to go and quit my job. Again, it may, it may be that. I don't know what you do for work and what God is telling you. But we're not, for, the, for most of us, we're not going to go and quit our jobs tomorrow. But it means we go with a different mentality. 
that now I, I go back to my marriage and I'm going to serve in my marriage. I go back to work and I'm going to serve at work. When I come to church, it's not, oh, I hope he preaches good today. No, no one does that here. Thank God. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to make it. All you guys are like this looking at me. I'm like, what's going on with the people of God? <laughs> but, 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 okay. So it's not like you come to church, like, you better preach good today, pastor. Right? No, you come to church. How can I serve? How can I serve the body of Christ? How can I serve here at church? When we have that mentality, it's going to allow us to go farther than we have ever can go before. Because we're not wired to live selfishly. And when we're consumed with selfishness, that's when, that's when things get hard. That's when things get depressing in our life. Because when we're consumed with selfishness, the way the world is, we never will get everything we want. After we get what we want, we're going to want something else. But if we're pursuing the goodness of God and His perfect plan, because He is perfect and He never fails, the way He set things up for us, it's only going to bring greater joy, greater fulfillment, and that's through a S word called serving. So Elisha is serving the people around him. He's serving God by serving Elijah, the man of God. And Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 says this, to them, um, and you read the whole chapter, it's referring to the church. We are still the church of God that when the scripture was written, written 2,000 years ago, it's being spoken to the church today. So to us, we are the church. To them, the church, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles at that time 2,000 years ago. Gentiles are people who are outside of faith. Okay, the, the, the followers of Christ. And so Gentiles are, you could say, those that don't know God right now, those who aren't in church. The glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So go ahead and look at your neighbor and say, Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Come on. So the glorious riches that we have, like, I love this, right? So even though we leave everything behind, total surrender, following God, we have inside of us the glorious riches. More rich than anything else that we can find outside in this world, we have inside of us. And what is that? It's Christ Jesus. What is Christ Jesus? Not just someone who died for us, but someone who's coming back for us. That's the hope of glory. That's the beauty of our hope. So many people, they hope in temporal things that may or may not happen. What we hope in, who we hope in, it's already happened because he's already come and he's already done it and will happen again. We have the ultimate hope. He is the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and end. And so we're not just hoping in something that is historical we're also hoping something that will happen. And that gives us this eternal hope. And the reason why I'm emphasizing this, church, is because we are the body of Christ. And if Jesus is the hope of the world and Jesus is inside of us, we are the hope of the world. And so this call that, that I'm submitting to you today to be resilient resilient in the way we serve, resilient the way we love, the resilient the way we minister to others around us is not just for a few like small group leaders in here, those that uh, help lead our serve teams, uh, ministers up here, worship team. This cause for every believer. Every believer, that mantle is coming upon you. And now let's conclude. This is so exciting. We're going to fast forward. Several years later, Elisha is faithfully serving Elijah. And word gets out that Elijah is about to be taken up to heaven. Now, this is not an ordinary day. This is not normal. Okay? In Scripture, in the Old Testament, only the other person that got taken up to heaven is Enoch. So only two people in the Old Testament never tasted death. And then Jesus in the New Testament is the other one that, got, that gets taken up to heaven while here on this earth. And not just a vision of heaven, like literally like beam me up, Jesus, you know, like gone. So, so the prophets, they understood this is what's happening to Elijah. And so this is what the conversation uh, ensues from that moment on in chapter 2. As they were walking along and talking together, 
Elijah and Elisha, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. This is amazing. You know, now we have like Uber and Lyft. Man, Elijah had a chariot of fire from heaven. That is a, I just can't handle that. That's amazing. Praise God. <laughs> Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of, and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood at the bank of the Jordan. So why this is important here is this whole time Elijah is asking um, Elisha, he's like, when I'm taken up, what do you want? What do you want to be done for you or to you? Elisha could have asked for many things, but he says, I want a double portion. Everyone say double portion. And so Elijah said, if you see me while I'm taken up, it will be done to you. And so the first time that Elijah threw the cloak on Elisha, it was for the call of God. Some of us, we've been following God. But now today, we want to believe God to take us to the next level. And this double portion was Elijah's next level of ministry. From serving, he now had a greater impact where Elijah performed, um, gosh, I think it was 14 miracles. You can count them in the Old Testament. Elisha performed 28. So the double portion happened. And so for our lives, it's amazing because I, as I was reading that, that, that moment, I'm trying to picture this chariot of fire with flaming horses taking e Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. And, and Elisha is just watching him. I think, I think about John chapter 14, verse 12. Jesus makes this amazing statement. He says, very truly I tell you that whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than this because I am going to the Father. And so he was, Jesus in the book of Acts was with his disciples. And while they were together, Jesus gets taken up from them and they're looking at him like Elisha was looking at Elijah what's the point of this as we continue to pursue the call of our of God on our lives we need to continue to fixate our eyes on Jesus because when we do God brings the double portion upon us and double portion is not just you know like this like you go to Dave's ice cream, and you get green tea or whatever your favorite flavor is. Instead of one scoop, they give you two scoops. <gasps> Praise God, double portion. <laughs> this is so amazing. <laughs> it's so much better than that. Double portion in, in Scripture means inheritance. And we see that both times when this double portion happened upon the church, when Jesus was taken up, and it happened upon Elisha, it was to fulfill the call of ministry. It was to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do ministry. And so in a moment, we're going to go back into worship, and uh, we're going to cry out to God. And we're going to pray for one another. Because this is the time. We can't be passive no more. And I love it. I love the response of what the church and the island, you know, just rallying and doing things giving financially, grabbing, you know, clothes from uh, different places, going to Costco and, and packing containers. That is great. But, but spiritually, more so, those are all temporal things. Those things eventually will be burned up. We need to live with that kind of urgency spiritually. And the time is now. And you talk about the timing of God. I close with this story. So Pastor Jonathan um, received, you know, again, con shipping containers full of stuff to get out to the people um, and, and realizing that, you know, they're in Kihei and they need to go all the way to Lahaina. But at that time, when everything first happened, so many roads were closed that they couldn't get the, all that, the goods that they received. They couldn't get it to the people with need. So they literally are at the beach. They're like, Man, what are we going to do? Because there's only two, two boats on this island right now that can take us. And they had like propane ca canisters. They had like very vital goods that people needed. You know, bottled waters, propane. 
and other materials, necessities. They're like, we got to get it to the other side. So they prayed, God, what are we going to do? <laughs> Only two boats on the island. I don't know how we're going to do this. One of the two boats shows up out of nowhere. <laughs> and the captain says, hey, do you guys need a boat? <laughs> yes. It is crazy how God's been working miracle after miracle after miracle on Maui. But the good news is we don't have to be spectators in all of this. I'm like, oh, that's such a good story, Pastor. No, he wants to involve every single one of us. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. Every single one of us, he wants to involve in this exciting call of what he's doing right now, right here on this earth, at this moment, in time, in history right now but for that to happen we need to burn up the things that need to be burned up and we need to pursue the things with the double portion that God wants to give us so let's all stand to our feet as I pray for us right now God we father God we thank you Lord for your word, your word brings conviction, your word brings revelation, your word brings truth. And Holy Spirit, even as the words were heard by every ear in here, we pray that our hearts would receive the truth of what you're telling us. It's been holding us back for too long. Romans 12, 9 says this, Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. And I love how Elisha ran after Elijah. Some of us, we haven't been running. We've been straddling the fence. We've been stuck. We've been held back. We've been anchored. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Father God, we shun it right now. We repent of it. We let it burn up in our souls right now. And so we pray in the name of Jesus that whatever does not belong in our lives that's causing us to be stuck, addictions, habits, sinful patterns, even false thinking. I'm not good enough. That I'm insignificant. That I can't make a difference. Father God, burn those things up right now in our minds. Burn it up in our hearts. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Father God, only you are good. And so we choose, Lord, for a total surrender right now. For a complete surrender. In Jesus' name. Church, let's go back into worship. So here I am.